Hi, everyone. Um, so I've only got 10 minutes to talk about the uh, long-term risk of PPI, so we'll just move on. I've, so it's, protein pump inhibitors are the most widely used class of drugs prescribed over the long term in all of clinical medicine. So we estimate up to 10% of adults have prescribed a PPI in the past 30 days. Um, and in 2009, already US about $13 billion was spent worldwide on PPI prescriptions per year. And so current estimates is about $47 billion spent on PPI prescriptions. So should we be concerned about long-term PPI use? So I first talk about the mechanisms of action and um, PPIs and things, and then we'll talk about the potential side effects. So as you all know, it inhibits the potassium and sodium, uh, potassium and hydrogen ATPase in parietal cells. And it's most effective when the parietal cell is stimulated to secrete acid postprandially. And so PPI should be administered before the first meal of the day because the um, amount of the ATPase present in parietal cells is greatest following a prolonged fast. If you take one daily PPI for five days, it inhibits the maximal gastric acid output by about 66%, so not 100%. Um, the acid secretory capacity may not be restored for 24 to 48 hours after discontinuing. And um, in clinical trials, they, the way they assess the PPI efficacy is um, by the median pH greater than four times. So if you, obviously, the more effective if you have a greater amount of um, pH greater than four times. So why are some PPIs more effective in some patients than others? And this is due to the um, cytochrome P450 um, um, genotype differences, uh, CYP2C19 genotype. Um, so the rabeprazole and esomeprazole are CYP independent, so they're the newest um, PPIs, but not available in New Zealand. 5% um, of Caucasians and 12 to 23% of Asians are homozygous for the inactivating mutation, so that causes delayed metabol metabolism of PPI, so they have higher PPI <coughs> concentrations in their blood. Um, whereas if you're homozygous for the wild type gene, you're rapid metabolizers, they have a lower PPI plasma concentration. So if you're a homozygous for the wild type gene or you're a rapid metabolizer, you're less likely to have successful treatment. So 46% success in rapid metabolizers versus 85% you know, in normal metabolizers. So as you all know, we have three PPIs um, funded in New Zealand, omeprazole, pentoprazole and soprazole. Are they equivalent? Um, so I found this, uh, this uh, article, Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology, in June 2018. It's really, really useful, actually, because I previously thought that the um, pantoprazole 20 milligrams is equivalent to omeprazole 20 milligrams, but it is not. So, so this um, table says the omeprazole equivalent, and so you say 20 milligrams of omeprazole is equivalent to 20 milligrams, but if you take uh, 20 milligrams of pantoprazole, it's only equivalent to 4.5 milligrams of omeprazole. Um, <laughs> so lansoprazole is 15 milligrams, it's 13 and a half milligrams. And so if you look at the newer ones, um, they're more potent, so they you know, have got higher dose um, efficacy. And so how do they work that out? So this graph here shows um, once daily dosing after five days is a steady state. And so let's say if you take pantoprazole 40 milligrams a day, that's equivalent to 9 milligrams of omeprazole. So at this graph here, so it sort of has a pH greater than four times, about maybe 40%. 40, 40%. Um, and so if you increase the dose of the omeprazole, to, so the curve sort of goes up and it peaks at about 60, 60 milligrams, let's say, of omeprazole equivalent. And so the sort of the pH greater than four times, about 60, 65% um, on once daily dosing. And that doesn't go, you know, even if you increase the dose, it doesn't go up any higher. So it sort of plateaus. So how do you increase the um, dose of omeprazole? So you double the dose. So this is. Um, on BD dosing, so let's say pantoprazole 40 milligrams BD, which is equivalent to 18 <coughs> milligrams of omeprazole. So then the curve goes up to, so it, you know, pH greater than four times goes up to about 60%. So just doubling the dose, it does increase. And so even like the 60 milligram um, equivalent, um, it sort of picks up at sort of um, uh, 80, 85%. So, um, so BD dosing is obviously better than once daily dosing, even at you know, similar doses, dose equivalents, so 60 milligrams um, taken on a BD dosing gives you a better efficacy than a once daily dosing. Um, and so this graph says, uh, shows a TDS dosing, it's really no better than BD dosing. So, so that's interesting. Um, so this slide is a busy one, but it just shows the potential side effects of PPI. So the organs that can be affected. 
Um, so brain, liver, there's gut, bones, um, kidney, um, and there's sort of coronary artery and stroke and things like that. So we'll talk about some of them and see whether, what, um, whether there's enough evidence to say that this is true or not. And so the mechanism um, is mainly it's hypochloridia. So if you reduce stomach acid, um, it may allow survival of more organisms. And so prior studies have reported an overexpression of or oral bacteria in the feces of individuals taking PPIs. And so you know, th that makes sense. An increased ratio of firmicutes, which is the bad bacteria, um, to bacteroides at the phylum level. And so if you reduce the acidity, again, it may allow survival of microbes, especially acid-sensitive organisms, such as the Vibrio, the Salmonella, the Campylobacter. And the PPIs is thought also to increase intestinal permeability. So um, some observational studies have reported an association between PPI use and C. diff infection, but this, the causal link hasn't been demonstrated. So what about uh, cancer? So um, we know that if you induce gastric hypoacidity, um, it interferes with the feedback pathway. So low acid in the stomach um, uh, makes you secrete more gastrin. And so hypogastrinemia is associated with increased risk of gastric adenocarcinoma and neuroendocrine tumours. And so the Danish prescription registry, so the, the Scandinavians have huge databases of patients, so it's 1.5 million patients taking acid suppressant medications matched to unexposed population-based controls. And so those with five or more prescriptions for PPIs were six-fold and tenfold more likely to develop proximal and distal gastric cancer. So we think this is real. Um, there is some evidence that it increases um, cancer. What about kidney disease? Um, weak data, so a, a lot of um, residual confounding. Um, but when compared to non-PPI users, um, the pool risk there is you know, slightly elevated. And then when compared to H2 receptor antagonists, again, the pool risk is slightly, slightly more. Um, but the data is sort of weak. Um, what about the brain? Does it cause cognitive decline? Um, so the concern came from a German cohort study on health and ageing, which assessed nursing home patients. Um, but since then, more recent studies have shown no um, risk of cognitive decline. So there's four recent ones, and then there's large cohort studies, including the US population-based cohort study, the Finnish cohort study, which haven't shown any association. So I don't think this is real. Um, what about MIs and strokes? Um, again, meta so these sort of evidence all really come from meta-analysis um, or cohort studies. So they're not really sort of um, they're sort of weak evidence, if you like. So um, there is a sort of increased hazard ratio, but again, quality of evidence is low. Another sort of Danish sort of cohort study with 200,000 patients showed a minimal increased incidence in ischemic stroke and EMIs and PPI users, but again, confounded by variables such as smoking, obesity, and exercise. Um, <laughs> and two large recent American cohort studies haven't shown an increase in risk. Uh, what about osteoporosis? Um, so the Taiwanese study, uh, again a retrospective cohort study, um, shows there is an increased risk of osteoporosis in hip fractures in stroke patients. And again, a recent systematic review does show that they have increased 26% higher risk of hip fractures than non-PPI users. So we think, again, this is real. Um, and this is from long-term use, so it doesn't, you know, if you only use it for three months or something, it doesn't, doesn't increase it. So who should remain on long-term treatment? So this is absolute indication of a long-term treatment. And so the treatment of erosive esophagitis, so if you've got grade C and D, the reflux esophagitis, if you stop treatment, the risk of relapse is 72%. So these patients should remain on long-term treatment. Um, if you have PPI-responsive esophageal eosinophilia, you are high-risk long-term anti-inflammatory users, <laughs> like you know, people with rheumatoid arthritis and stuff, um, that's for chemo prevention. Um, and then the Barrett's esophagus is an absolute indication, and obviously Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. So, last slide, Alistair. So, how do I stop long-term treatment? So, you need to identify pa patients who need long-term treatment and those who don't. So, and those who don't um, include functional dyspepsia, um, non-erosive reflux disease. So, if they have symptoms but their gastroscopy is completely normal, you can treat them with a course and then try and stop them. So laryngopharyngeal reflux, or some have no specific indication identified. So they are on them, and you, you know. So you need to go through the, the list of medications, and the longer of a patient's on a PPI, especially the high dose, the harder it is to stop. 
And we know that if you suddenly stop, it can result in a rebound effect because of the uh, gas hypergastronemia. So there's a sudden rise in the gastric acid output because the gastrin levels are still high. And so you need to do a step-down approach. Um, so what we normally do is if patients are on BD or Meprazole, you can try and cut down to once daily for a couple of weeks. Um, and if they're still fine, then you cut down to maybe once every alternate day and then stop. But if they stop and the symptoms come back, you can still use it PRN. Um, it can continue to be effective in many patients. <coughs> and um, you can also consider the H2 receptor antagonists to improve symptoms. So thank you. Thank you.